Um, let's see, biophysics, my life, 10 minutes, here we go. So this, my life's path was not straight. Um, I started liking uh, math, did a lot of electronics, things like that. Um, uh, and um, later on moved into biology, later moved into chemistry, spent a lot of years at UCSF in the pharmaceutical chemistry department, and I'm kind of a biophysicist. Uh, anyway, I hope the rest of you are able to do somewhat better than that. I was born in Oklahoma in high school. I liked uh, electronics, built a lot of gizmos, um, fixed TV sets back in the 60s. TV sets were all made out of vacuum tubes, so they broke a lot. Um, all my neighbors had broken TVs. They're really easy to fix when they're made out of vacuum tubes because the, the vacuum tubes just blow out, so you just replace them. So I made a pretty good living for a while uh, just fixing television sets. Did a little ham radio, science fair, stuff like that. Went to MIT in mechanical engineering uh, for the physics and math. And then um, in my last year at MIT, I did a master's degree in biomedical engineering uh, to figure out if I wanted to do research and do a PhD program or not. Um, and I got involved in a little um, reading course with a person named Alex Rich, who was a very prominent structural biologist who had worked with Watson and Crick on DNA structure. And he was, a, he was very inspiring and he taught a course on origins of life. And I thought that seemed super interesting. So then I applied to graduate school at UC San Diego. Um, I went there um, thinking a lot about origins of life. And so these were the two guys I rotated with first. Uh, Stanley Miller and Leslie Orgel were uh, two prominent people in that business. Um, Miller of the Miller and Urey experiment back in the 1950s. And uh, Leslie Orgel was prominent too. I worked with those two guys. Uh, I learned uh, a couple of important things, however. One is I couldn't see how anybody would ever be able to prove anything one way or the other about origins of life. So it just seemed to me like it wasn't the place I wanted to go. And what was even worse in a sort of local decision kind of way was as a guy who was a sort of an engineer, engineer math guy um, walking into biology and chemistry, I discovered I didn't know which end of a pipette to stick in my mouth. Uh, back in the day, they didn't used to have pipettes on the end. You, you actually just um, took it into your mouth and you sucked up the molecules. Anyway, it was just, it was clear that wasn't the right route for me. So then I worked for the guy on the left here, Bruno Zim. He was at UC San Diego. He was kind of perfect for me. Uh, he was a chemical physicist. He did theory. He was a polymer statistical mechanics guy. He was working on DNA molecules at the time. <clears throat> he was also known for Zim Bragg theory of helix coil transitions and Rao Zim theory of polymer solutions. Wonderful human being. Um, one of the things I, I really loved and one of the reasons I ended up in his lab was he had a little room in the back. He had an experimental shop and in the back of the experimental shop, he had a little electronic setup. And so I kind of took it over. It was, uh, had been a former hobby and I thought this, this ought to be really fun. Anyway, he was a terrific guy to work with. Then I did a postdoc with uh, Paul Flory at Stanford, also polymer statistical mechanics. In a course that Zim taught in graduate school, he mentioned a problem, this is now in the 1970s, mentioned a problem called the protein folding problem, which just seemed very intriguing. And so I thought some about it and thought polymer stat mech might have something useful to say about it. So when I went to a postdoc with Flory, I got to thinking, is there a simpler sort of starter problem a person could work on? And I got to thinking about chain packing in uh, micelles and surfactant micelles. It was a similar chain packing problem that you had a sphere, uh, the chain was tight, but you had a lot more symmetry. It seemed simpler from a statistical mechanical point of view than protein folding, but it seemed like a good place to start. So I went to work with Flory um, on the micelle problem and we worked on that. After I left Flory, um, then I started my first faculty position and I started off thinking about protein folding. And this is then the, like, let me see, the early 1980s. So this was the structural biologist view of a protein. And this is the way we were all supposed to think about proteins, but having come from polymer statistical mechanics, there were certain things I just loved about both Zim and Flory uh, and, and the reasons that I went there. One was, uh, I love the elegance and power of analytical theory. Um, it's not um, 
all well, that commonly done, but in polymer stat mech, it had been in the past. Um, I like the elegance of it. I liked um, the simplicity uh, of, sim of simple models, and I like model making, and I like the challenge of this sort of these kinds of um, big question uh, problems. Anyway, this is how people were thinking about proteins at the time, but I decided that I wanted to have a little simpler view of it. So this is my view of uh, what proteins look like. Now, the problem is um, it's, it's one thing to make a simplified model, um, but it's another to make sure you don't simplify it too much. And so I, for 30 years after working on these simple models, um, I had all these uphill battles with experimentalists who said, uh, you know, that doesn't look like a protein at all, which was certainly true. We got rid of a lot of the side chains and the details and that sort of thing. Um, but the trouble is that if you simplify, you have to be careful not to simplify too much because it seems like sort of cutting, um, cutting, uh, it, cutting things short around the edges. It's kind of like this brain surgery half off this week. This is uh, you. You, you want to make sure you don't do things. You don't cut too much. So that my early work was um, these two things were kind of the beginnings of where we started off. One was. We developed this thing called the HP lattice model of the folding code. Uh, HP is hydrophobic and polar. Um, Two-dimensional lattices <clears throat> turned out two dimensions actually had advantages, big advantages over 3D, not just because they were smaller, but also because the critical thing about the driving forces of folding has to do with surface to volume ratios. And in three dimensions, the trouble is if you want to get the surface to volume ratio of myoglobin, you have to look at about 100 and 30, 150 more protein, whereas in two dimensions, you get the same surface to volume ratio in these little 16 mers. So this was very useful for learning about the folding code um, encoded in the side chains and the, and the uh, hydrophobic and polar sequences. Uh, we also, using these kinds of models, um, discovered that proteins fold on funnel-shaped energy landscapes. And then um, soon thereafter, Jose Onacek and Peter Wolinus also started working in this area uh developed into a, a lot of effort in that in that world i do i want to give some credit to flory here because the the idea of thinking about using protein statistical mechanics and bringing it into proteins um came from one insight of his from 1940 this is from the flory huggins theory and here's the here's the problem that we were thinking about this is the folding problem in its sort of simplest form as we were envisioning it back then on the left side shows you the number of configurations of a random flight chain that has 100 monomers in it, uh, say peptide units. And you have a huge number of conformations. Suppose you have Z as the number of rotational isomers around each bond. I have, let's say, three of that, three different states, um, a trans gauche plus and a gauche minus, for example, and I have 100, or I'll have 10 to the 50th different conformations. And the question back then, um, starting the folding problem was this astronomical size of conformational space, how does the protein ever find its native structure in a reasonable time? A lot of proteins actually now known uh, will fold up in microseconds. And the insight from Flory was that it's not Z to the nth that I need to, Z to the n that I need to worry about. It's not 10 to the 50th. He had done in Flory Huggins theory in the 40s, if you go through the details, you'll see there's this little factor of E in his equations. And it turns out where that comes from is that if you put a chain molecule in amongst other chains, so you got like spaghetti, then uh, all the surrounding chains restrict the conformational space so that the actual number of conformations that are available to a given chain is actually not Z of the nth, it's Z over E to the nth. And if Z is 3 and E is 2.7, then it turns out you reduce conformational space hugely, in this case, by like 45 orders of magnitude. And that was the basic insight behind thinking about where folding funnels came from. There was a lot more theory that we did in the old days, but this really uh, was thanks to Flory's insights. Um, and one last point I want to make, and that has to do with uh, a lesson I learned the hard way. And that is that a picture is worth a thousand words and it's worth 12 years. So we did this work in the mid 1980s 
And in about 1997, Buzz Baldwin, a prominent experimentalist, published a, an article, a big article in Nature News and Views, where he said, there's this new view of protein folding. What he was talking about was these funnel-shaped energy landscapes. But it wasn't new. It was 12 years old. And so the question is, why did it take Buzz and his folks um, 12 years to figure it out? And I think the answer was because we didn't start making these silly little um, Mathematica pictures uh, for a lot of years. In the early years, we were just computing densities of states, and we were all, Onachek and Wallenis and I were all giving talks until we were blue in the face talking about, um, talking about uh, reductions of densities of states and things like that, but that's dry as dust. And so finally in the mid nineties, we started thinking, hmm, what, what about if we make pictures? Because this is very funnel like. And so we started making these pictures and suddenly it became the new view. Everybody started to understand what we were doing. And so what I learned from that is it's a really good idea to make good graphics, good pictures, simple explanations and stuff. And that's it. That's my life. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for um, two, three questions. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, I have a um... I don't know, maybe a silly question. Um, you said you did your um, undergrad in mechanical engineering and I did too. And I'm just curious, like how has it been applying for faculty jobs when your research is very different from your background? Um, Cause that's something I'm kind of wondering about in terms of like departments and things in the future. I would say it's dependent on your field. Um... Mechanical engineering and chemical engineering, for example, are very different. The chemical engineers will tend to hire people who are only chemical engineers. So if you're if you don't have a chem engineering background, at least this is my experience. Uh, if you don't have a chem engineering background and you're applying for a position in the chem engineering department, it's unlikely. Uh, on the other hand, there's some kinds of departments where um, your background is less relevant. Physicists, applied math departments, for example, chemistry departments. Uh, biophysics, physiology departments, many of these other kinds of departments are very happy to take you from whatever background they just care about. What's the problem? What are you working on? Is it interesting? Do you have a story? It's really the, in my, my mind, there's really one thing and that is, do you have a story? If you can tell an interesting story, then you can kind of walk into any So can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, hi Ken. So I, I th then a related question is this. Suppose you, you are in a department like a pharmaceutical things. The question is, the challenge would be how to attract students who want you know, to generate trainees with a theoretical background. Yes, that's what, very what good. Otherwise. Yes, that's a very good question. This question really ought to go to Steve Press because he, he came in asking the same, Steve was a postdoc in the lab and I was at UCSF and he was asking very much the same question. I'm a physicist, uh, what am I doing here and uh, will this work? And, <laughs> and I guess um, my answer to that is that um, it does depend on the place. So mostly at UCSF, which is only a health sciences campus, um, the graduate student, first of all, the students and postdocs that we attracted at UCSF were just outstanding, uniformly outstanding. But a lot of the graduate students came in more sort of interested in the drug discovery end of things and turning on computers rather than writing down analytical theories. So I pretty much never had a graduate student at UCSF who did analytical theory, I think one exception to that. And so we did the analytical theory with postdocs and Steve was the, Steve is really the outstanding example of that. He did some phenomenal theory while he was, while he was in the group. Um, and so, but at Stony Brook, where I am now, uh, we have a very strong physics department, a very strong applied math and, and chemistry too. And so um, now a lot of the graduate students come in from string theory and they really, really want to do analytical theory. So it does depend on the place. Um, but I would say it's also true that um, you can find pathways. You know, if you're in department X and the students you want are in department Y, then get yourself an appointment over there and 
go give talks over there and you'll be able to find students that um, will trickle over to you. It does take a while. You know, many of you here are, are pretty young and early stage, career stage, I would say. And so it is, it is true that there's a time constant here. The day you walk in as a brand new assistant professor is not the day that all of the graduate students start pouring in the lab. It does take a little while. All right, thank you so much, Ken.